Uh, you see these happy, smiling, handsome French people in a, in a wine bar in Paris. And on the wall, essentially, is a uh, spreadsheet full of data that you're supposed to interrogate and understand to do your order. And the reason pricing is interesting is because it's all about manipulation. It's about sort of psychological manipulation between you uh, and between the person selling you something. So when you sit down at a wine list and you think, well, I'm not going to buy the one at the top because I'll look cheap. So you go, OK, I'm going to buy the second one from the top. But you know that the sommelier knows that. So the second wine from the top is the most profitable wine on the list. So you think, well, I don't want to play that game. I'm not going to be suckered into buying the most profitable wine. So you then go and buy a more expensive wine. And then you've been suckered into buying more expensive wine. So the whole thing just becomes this, this mind game between you and uh, the place you are. And this happens wherever you're looking at pricing. So your own personal price, which is your salary, is something that is enormously kind of personal and people get worked up about it and people can have great jobs that are only spoiled by the fact they're not happy with their salary. So pricing becomes very psychologically uh, important and people get very worked up about it. So last year, uh, Uber presented what is called simple you know, first year economics, which is supply and demand. They said, if there's a storm in Manhattan, all the taxi drivers are at home going, I'm not going out in that storm, it's ridiculous. Uh, so you can't get a cab. So Uber said, we will do surge pricing. If, if, the, if uh, demand goes up, we will raise the price in the hope that supply will go up. So um, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, who is worth $800 million personally, his wife uh, had to take a son to a bar mitzvah across Manhattan in a snowstorm, and she was charged $415 by Uber. She freaked out, uh, Twitter freaked out, uh, and people just said, this is price gouging, I'm going to cancel my subscription to Uber, uh, it's totally unfair. And what it was was simple supply and demand, simple pricing, but people got very emotionally involved in it and people got very angry. So next year, uh, next week, it's South by Southwest, uh, and there's 800 talks at South by Southwest. There is one about pricing. Uh, one talk is uh, a guy with a startup where he wants to sell... Um, sporting event tickets like airline tickets. But that's the only thing. In technology, in startup, in media, we don't like talking about pricing. I think it makes us uncomfortable. We're much more comfortable talking about people, as you said earlier. We get excited that um, Vice Media has three and a half million followers on YouTube. We don't get nearly as excited that it has a revenue of $110 million. Um, and we like companies like Netflix uh, and Spotify. So Netflix have this very, very simple pricing model. They say, we've got one product, which is full access to all our videos. That product is $5.99. That's it. And we love those kind of simple things. Or Spotify, it's a very, very simple model. Except it's not going to last. Last week, Reed Hastings was on a, uh, his, um, the conference call when the results came out. And he said they are dropping this single price. And they're, so they're moving to a good, better, best model. So the reason Reed Hastings is doing that uh, goes back to a piece of research done in 1983 uh, by two uh, American researchers at Duke University. And they were interested in pricing, and quite sensibly they said the way to find out about pricing is to ask students about beer. So they did three experiments. So the first one was not terribly exciting. This is the first one. The two bottles of beer and they asked people which one they'd buy. 30% bought the cheap one, 70% bought the more expensive one. So the second round, it, it does get more interesting. Uh, the second round, uh, they introduced an economy beer, which was a little bit cheaper. Now, I think students at Duke University in the early 80s were rather different from students at Leeds University in the 1990s when I was there because nobody bought the cheap beer. <laughs> but what was interesting was that it completely skewed the market. So... The other two, you can see it pull the whole market down. Uh, and whereas previously 30% of people bought the cheaper beer, now just by putting bottles of the beer that nobody touched, it's pulled the market down. You can tell what's coming next. The next experiment, they invented a premium beer. So this was a £3.40 beer. This would have gone down well in the bars around here. Uh, what actually happened was, once again, nobody bought the cheap beer. And this was the beer that in the first experiment, 30% of people bought. 90% of people were the middle beer. People like to be in the middle, just as when you're looking at the wine list. You just want the ordinary wine. You want the proper wine that will taste okay and is sensible. You don't want the expensive one, you don't want the cheap one, you want the middle one. 
uh, and 10 percent of people bought the more expensive one. So hopefully I have, I have explained with this why pricing is interesting. Pricing is psychologically interesting. It gets in our head. But the other thing this experiment shows is that pricing is important. If you look at how much money you would have made by just adding an expensive bottle of beer that only 10% of people touch, you've doubled the revenue you're making from your off license. So this what seems like small changes can have an enormous impact on your, on your revenue. So I was looking for a big example of how pricing can have an effect on the world. This graph, as I'm sure you will recognize, is the graph of oil prices during the 1980s. So at the beginning, oil is $110 a barrel. In the middle, it drops to about $30 a barrel. Uh, and this was an interesting graph for the Soviet Union. At the time, the Soviet Union was selling oil to buy bread or to buy wheat to make bread to feed their, fat, feed their population. So at the beginning of the decade, you could buy enough wheat to make 3,000 loaves of bread with a barrel of oil. Suddenly, in the middle of the decade, the oil price drops. Their whole, I'll call it their business, their whole country is turned upside down because that barrel of oil will only get you 800 loaves of bread. There's an awful lot fewer loaves of bread. The impact that had on the Soviet Union, obviously, ten, you know, by the end of the decade, just five years later, the Soviet Union has collapsed, the Eastern Bloc has collapsed, and you've had this incredible impact that we're still feeling today around the world. But as you know, I am not uh, here. We're here at an event about uh, media disruption, not about sort of global geopolitics of the 1980s. So the reason I'm here is to talk about the most disruptive thing that I've ever done in media, uh, which was building the paywall, starting to charge for the time. So in 2010, we changed the price of the Times Digital product from this to this. We introduced a paywall. We started charging two pounds. And as you will expect from what I said previously, when we did this, people freaked out. People thought this was a, a very, very radical thing to do and a very strange thing to do. Uh, this man, I don't know if anyone remembers him, used to be the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And in 2010, he was looking after two wars, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. But he thought he should take time out to give his views on pricing policy. Uh, and he said, there's a whole sort of element of communication that's got to be free. So we introduced the paywall. Uh, we started charging people. Everyone said it wouldn't work. And within about uh, a year, we had about 120,000 people signed up, and they were paying two pounds a week. We did actually do the experimenting with cheaper prices and higher prices, and that's another talk. But we did at one point have a, um, you can either subscribe for two pounds or you can see a day for a pound. And had I seen the research about the beer, I wouldn't have done that because it just meant loads of people bought the cheap one. Uh, so we, we introduced the paywall, it was going well, and we felt like this. Uh, we thought we've, we've changed the media industry, the whole thing has been a great success. Then we sort of stepped back and we started to look at what we'd done and think about the ec economics of what had happened. So this is my one slide guide to newspaper economics. Uh, essentially, if you go to a news agent and buy a broadsheet paper every day for a week, you're giving them about eight quid a week. If, you have, if that paper has a decent ad, ad, ad department and they are selling well and you've got a decent, buoyant advertising economy, you get about another eight pounds from those print ads. So we move to digital. If you are lucky enough to be the Times and you have a healthy, vibrant paywall, uh, you might get two pounds a week, which is what they're getting at the time for each of those customers. And then there's digital advertising. Um, so we looked at it and we said, OK, we're taking 16 pound people and turning them into two pound people. And then we were sad and we thought this was, this was disappointing. We were doubly sad because you realized that the thing we were going to have to do was raise the price. We had made a mistake with the price and we needed to raise the price. And that, as with all of these things, psychologically is a very difficult thing. You've taken a whole newsroom, a whole organization through the process of going from, from free and you've got 22 million readers to paid and you've got 100,000 readers. And then you have to go back and say, well, what we're going to do now, we're going to double the price. And that's a very difficult message to get across and it's a very difficult message for you personally. You think, I'm going to kill it. You know, I've made this thing and now we're going to kill it by, by, dropping the, by doubling the price. 
So, uh, yes, the, pay, the, the, the other interesting thing that I actually have only thought about recently is we had all this fuss with the Prime Minister going from zero to two pounds. It's exactly the same change going from two pounds to four pounds. Uh, and we didn't get nearly the attention. Uh, so this is how we did it. This is, uh, there, there was about 70,000 people who were involved. There were people who had signed up at a particular time and who were paying two pounds and we needed to get to paying four pounds. And this is... 70,000 people at the Millennium in the stadium. So it took about 18 months. We said to people, we are going to put the price up, but you are safe on your existing price. So we grandfathered them. And then over that time, we said, we, were, we started to segment people according to how, the, how they were using the products, what they were doing, so that we could work out how we message them and, and what journey we take them on. So there was a small group of people who were paying us every month, but never, ever used the product. Uh, those people, we just left there. We didn't say anything to them. Uh, we said, that'll be fine, you can carry on paying two pounds a week, you don't need to pay four pounds a week, That's, you just keep there. There may be companies in the world who would have rung them up and said, have you noticed you're not using our product, would you like to cancel? But I wouldn't have done that myself and we didn't. There was another group who were using the product, they were coming to the website you know, once or twice a week, they were maybe using the iPad app when they were on holiday, they were using it, but we thought, they're not really getting four pounds a week out of it. So those people, we basically created a new little tier just for them and said, you can stay there, you can pay two pounds a week, we're not gonna touch you. The vast bulk of people actually were using the products, they were reading the iPad every day for half an hour, they were coming back to the website time and time again, they were leaving comments. Those people seemed to say, it's a fair cop, I'm getting four pounds worth out of this, and we told them it was going up, they went up, they paid, nothing happened. There's a group of people who you have who are difficult. So there are people who would ring up and say, right, I'm going to cancel because you put the price up. And you had a whole range of little strategies to deal with them. Some people you would say, oh, why don't you have a 25 pound M&S voucher and stick around for another year? And they'd go, okay, fine, I'll do that. Some of them you would maybe move into the green area and you say, well, if you're really not using it much, you can stay on two pounds. Some people, you just talk to them nicely on the phone. I say, you, I wasn't doing it myself. They, they were sensible enough not to let me talk to them. Uh, but they would, you know, you would, you would just win them around. And then there's a bunch of people who leave. And it was about 10% of that group left. And you look at this and you think, well, that's kind of okay. You know, it's something better than we feared. We thought more people would go. And this is that kind of mentality we have where we're thinking about people rather than thinking about money, which sounds like a reasonable thing to do. But not necessarily in business. So the way I look at it, this, if you can't see, is actually a man reading the iPad on the tube. Uh, you, you think of it as, okay, we did this thing, it was difficult, and we lost 10% of people. Okay. When you look at it in terms of money, you say, okay, we did this thing, and suddenly you got 16 pounds more than you had before for the same number of customers. And that process for me personally of going through and saying, Let's actually think about money and think about what we're getting from people and how we change that relationship. Uh, it was very interesting. It seems to be something that we don't necessarily do that often. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with the best piece of business advice that I've ever received that my first ever editor a long, long time ago was working actually for the Ministry of Sound, an editor there. And the advice she gave me was this. And that's me.